Okay, so episode 19, I believe, of Never Settle Podcast. Um, we're excited to be here. Uh, we were talking about a lot, actually, in the last few weeks, um, the topic of kind of what does it mean for Father uh, Yeshua, Jesus, to be our king. And um, yesterday we had a really cool moment. Um, we kind of do a little meetings, like, throughout the week, and from inside the group, one of our guys, Nate, a really good friend of ours, and um, does a lot of our finance stuff, he was just talking about um, uh, a teaching that his church was doing on what it looks like for um, Earth to receive her king, and, you know, what does it look like for uh, your kingdom come, like, what does that, what does that mean, and he had a uh, pretty raw and awesome moment where he was just like, I want um, Father to be the king of my life, but he's not. I don't feel that way. And it just brought conviction to kind of all of us. And I know that we all feel similar that we, we're always talking about how we want that, but our life doesn't reflect that. I know I'm, I'm definitely at that point. So we're going to kind of talk about that and all the things that we've been learning in the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty. Who is sovereign? over the things that we say and do. Yeah, it's been, it, it kind of piggybacked really well of realizing that our, com, our um, perspectives were really on ourselves. And we, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And we've been really working on changing our perspectives internally as a company and individually. And within that, we started reading, um, a couple of us started rereading a book called The Final, Qu the Final Quest series by Rick Joyner. And in there, he has this prophetic, prophetic vision of meeting Yeshua in person. And Yeshua kind of gives him these instructions on what he needs to do when he goes back. And, and it, was, it was really timely and just um, very intense of what is the king of the universe. If you got to meet him face-to-face -face today, what, what would he say to you? And in Rick's conversation, um, hearing Messiah's call for how, how deep he loves us, but how how burdened he is with the things going on in the world and how much he wants us to be completely surrendered to him and follow his will was really, really intense. And then we had Nate come in and kind of mention that, hey, he, you know, um, it's funny. I don't know if Nate wants us to tell the world this, but um, Nate mentioning that maybe he's the king of his own life. Um, and so how, how do we get back to there? And, and for me, I've just been reading a lot of stuff recently. And in my quiet time, God keeps revealing this, like the time is now. There, there is no... The time is not indefinite. The king is coming back, um, and we are only here for but a vapor. And so how we choose to spend our lives is, is incredibly important. And, um, and opening myself up to that has really revealed my heart and how um, there's a lot of things I don't fully surrender to the king and how I still um, find myself dibby-dallying in my comforts very regularly. That's yeah, I was just reading that that part last night where it was, and it was interesting. It stood out to me um, that time is is our heavenly Father's mercy for us. Like every every breath that we've been given, every second, every minute, is really one more opportunity to to submit to His kingship in our life and to serve Him and and His kingdom. And we can either use that on ourselves, we can waste it, or we can we can surrender it. But it but there's that mercy component. We've been given one more day. We woke up today. We have health in our body. Um, all these things that we tend to take for granted, and um, those are are incredibly valuable things. But it's so easy to squander them, like you said, Ken, on our own comforts or desires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked how he he started talking right after that. He was talking about his judgments. Uh, the king's judgments and how we should actually um, we should be so in love with him and trust him so much that we should be desiring them for ourselves now and not waiting for the day when he judges the earth and that the mercy will be like that if we it's the, that idea of if we were to humble ourselves now we would be exalted later um, whereas if we don't choose to, to accept his judgments now and to truly humble ourselves before a our king um, we will be judged severely um, later on, and so that's. I feel like those are even sensitive words in our society. Um, I think, I think Andrew, you have a really great analogy about judgments, and judgments actually not always a bad thing, but in any case, we should. I, I've been very um, 
my eyes have been opened to realize that, yeah, I, I do want his judgments now because I want to be exposed. I want the stuff in my, the junk in my life exposed now, and I want to have that humble heart. And man, that is, I, I like saying it here, but when I look at my life, that is not how I live it every day. Like, I really get tied up into myself. Like, what do I want? You know, man, long yeah. day of work, house hunting, all that, whatever. I just want to unplug and watch a movie with my wife or whatever. And that stuff's not bad in itself, but, um, my comfort, I've realized, is becoming a high priority in my life over the brokenness in the world and the things that King is calling me into. Or even pulled away from bro uh, brokenness, and I'll stop here. Just worship, just dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with the King. Because I know a lot of people get worried about, like, oh, it's not about, you know, your ministry can take over, and I agree with that. But um, between serving others and then just taking the time to be totally captured and captivated by our King, just, just, I mean, intense worship. Like, am I? Is that more important to me, or is just kind of unplugging for a while more important? Mm -hmm. Man, that's uh, yeah. That's th those are huge challenges, and I think, like, I feel like I I know all the right answers, or I've heard all the right things, but like the application part of it is like such a challenge, and like such a I think a daily. Um, it's a daily battle, really, and like, yeah, like, just taking that time to worship and read or, or listen and like being intentional and stuff. And even in, I don't know, um, like, yeah, even in that, like, it, well, it kind of circles back to what we were talking about. Up. Yeah, like even we were discussing it last time, I think, or the time before, on the the concept of abiding in Him, right? And it's, um. That's something that stood out to me too. Like I would keep circling back to sort of Rick Joyner and what he was saying in, in the final quest. I'm reading it along with Ken. But um, one of the points that it hammered home to me was was just we're constantly making decisions of, of whose presence we're in, right? And we can either be in the presence of our king, learning from him and, and worshiping him and, and, and abiding in him, really you know, clinging to him as our source of, of perspective, really. Or we can be kind of doing our own thing, and that's going to define how we view everything. It really is, and and I think one of the challenges. Can you mention sort of the perspective on judgment? And I don't know if we talked about this in a previous podcast or not, but something that I realized was we have this very earthly view of judgment, and in in the fact that it has sort of generally this negative connotation. But in a biblical perspective, the concept of judgment is just that that rightness is enacted. It's this, this concept that that um, everything has been made right, the way it's supposed to be. And so if we trust our Creator, as we should completely, then we should not be afraid of His judgment, even if it's against us, because even in the process of our our discipline and our correction, he's making it right, and he's doing, he's taking, he's removing something from our lives that is dangerous and damaging and destructive, and so he's he's setting things back to the way they're supposed to be. Yep. Yeah, I think there's some verses I want to share that that I just randomly read in my quiet time this week, not intentionally, um, and before I read them, I guess kind of setting it up. My, the challenge I've had for myself is, um, does this stuff really matter? Like, like, is this really a big deal? You know, I think that's kind of the things that, do I need to let go of this stuff? Or, you know, God wants me to be happy, and all the kind of arguments I can have in my, in my head. And I read this stuff, and I'm just like, man, I, I just don't see that in the Word. And, and I also, like you said, his, it's every day that He gives us to, to turn and totally surrender to Him is a day of mercy. It's a, it's a second chance before, because at some point there will be no more chances, and so, um, and, and we'll look back and we'll be, you know, it's going to be a, a weird experience in being united with our King and the overwhelming joy that it's going to have, but also recognizing that, you know, we could have been so much closer to Him if we had chosen differently, you know, if we, we yeah. would have had a real perspective um, yeah. on what's important. And part of that will all tie into someone's view on heaven, which maybe should be a totally different podcast, but I would just, to give a quick <laughs> uh, preview, for me, I used to believe that once you got into heaven, like, like salvation was free and equal to all, which I, which I still believe, 
and then I believed that because of that, that meant like heaven was equal. It's just like we're all like the same. Like we all get the same reward. We all get to heaven. And um, and I would just challenge anybody to just read, just do a study on heaven, see what the Bible says about it. Because when I when I chose to do that, it completely blew my mind and changed everything I thought about it. And I realized that that my beliefs of heaven were not backed up by Scripture, even remotely close. And that 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 it does matter what we do here, and that there's that there's rankings and closeness and intimacy with with the King and rulership and authority that's given based on uh, what we do now. And so, and I think a great, a super great illustration of that, just to understand it in in our you know in our limited context now. I think you can take any specific thing. If you had a you know, let's say you had a friendship or relationship, you were really close with a person who lived in your neighborhood, and and you only had a certain amount of time where you lived in that neighborhood and, and let's say you moved to somewhere across the country, right? If you wasted the time that you had with that, that person while you were next to that person, your relationship is going to change when you move. It's just a, a matter of geography. And and you might be in that other place now and, and you can't go back and and reclaim that time. You can't do things differently, right? So even in our in our physical existence, if if we waste time and, and have regret about, oh I could have done this, this or this, like how much more than like when we get to the kingdom is it is it going to be looking back on our lives realizing that everything we did led to where we are in the end and how much more should we have done mm -hmm. and not man i'm going to have to find i'm going to have to step away have to find, i'm going to have to find a quote about that cuz it talks about i read something last night that talks about the beginning of wisdom and then the fullness of wisdom and the beginning of wisdom is 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 the fear of yahweh mm -hmm. and it says the full, and I want to paraphrase a little. It says the fullness of wisdom is being completely in love with Yahweh and the obedience that comes from the love. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we all want to get. And we all we all want to talk about relationship and stuff. But James is a great book. That's one of the ones I read that this morning, and uh, and that is a book that will change everything you think about <laughs> belief and works and and all that stuff that kind of gets convoluted by the church. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's out of I mean out of deep deep love, I'm gonna I'm gonna serve my wife right. Like I'm gonna do things for her. I'm not just gonna feel love in my heart. But when there's true love, it's gonna result in action in my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's the convicting point, right? Like um, I think I love the King, but my action is showing that I also really love the comforts of this world, things that help me de-stress, and things that are super um, short term well, and not long lived. And ultimately, that's love of self, right? Like that's mm -hmm. we we either love our our master or we love ourself in in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna read a couple of verses. I'm gonna just get your guys' thoughts. You guys don't even know what I'm gonna read yet. But I'm just gonna get some raw thoughts from you guys. So so we've been going through all this. We've been talking about it as a company, and like I said, just randomly in my quiet time, I these verses. I was going through the book of Hebrews and James, and these things really stood out to me and just seemed to be very timely. So we uh, we don't know who the author is, but we think it's Paul, and um, and so Paul is uh, the guy that murdered uh, all the first believers and then had an encounter with Yeshua personally, and then he uh, he decides to dedicate his life to it, and he goes around on missional adventures and writes letters to all these new churches, and he's writing to the to the Hebrews in this one, and. Um, and this, so I'm just going to read Hebrews 10. <clears throat> um, man. I'm going to start on 23 because I think it's important to set the context a little bit. So 10, 23 through 28. Um, and he says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our expectation without yielding, for he who promised is trustworthy. He's talking about the promise of the good news of Yeshua. And let us be concerned for one another in order to stir up love and good works. So again, just talking about the foundation of what we believe in. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging and, much, and so much more as you see the day coming near. And then here is where it was like a sledgehammer to my uh, personal ego self. It says, For if we sin purposely after we have received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a slaughtering offering for sins, but some fearsome anticipation of judgment and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponents. Anyone who has disregarded the Torah of Moses dies without compassion on the witness of two or three witnesses. 
How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted the spirit of favor? For we know him who has said, Vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says Yahweh. And again, Yahweh shall judge his people. His people. It is fearsome to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. And um, he kind of keeps going on, but that when I read that, I was just it was just a reminder. Like I don't have excuses. I don't yeah. not know, and I don't. I think the most the the, the hardest part for me was. I think before I've always read that other stuff about sinning and, you know, the fearsome anticipation, but the thing that really hit me hard this time was just, it uses the words to trample the son of Elohim under under your foot and count the blood of the covenant by which was set, as, set apart as common. Yeah, and let's wrap that, and let's find an analogy for that, because that is, I mean, that's so easy to read and not really connect with what it's really saying there, and I don't... I mean, this is not even adequate, <clears throat> but what comes to my mind is, you know, say you're a criminal, you rob, you steal something out of the store, say you do something worse, say you murder someone, that's up the stakes. You know, you're basically now in, under trial, you're, you're in prison, everything else, and someone comes along and, and basically posts your bail, like $10 million, whatever, is able to to get all the charges dropped against you and, and you're free, like you're a free man when you should basically be locked up for life. And then you go and do the exact same thing again. You go murder someone again and, and now you've basically trampled everything that that other person sacrificed to, to set you free from the consequences of your actions. And then you go back to the same actions and you're back in the same place, you know, basically intentionally enslaving yourself to the thing that cost the other person everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it uses, I mean, the blood, the blood of our Savior, like it's saying, counting that as common, like not sacred and not that it, that it costed him everything. He had to pour out his entire life mm -hmm. for those things. Yeah, that's just, what do you think, Shaw? Well, it's pretty heavy shit, <laughs> dude. Uh, <laughs> It's funny how the Lord does that, right? You're like, I'm just gonna read. I'm just gonna kind of read my my daily plan, and then it's like, pow. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same stuff. Like for me, in that, yeah, you read that, and like putting the like the seriousness behind that, and like really, like really walking in that, and like absorbing that, and like making it real. Like that's it's like it's hard I think I think that ties perfectly into you know w when when father is the king of your life that's that series of verses like is is tough like is pretty tough I think you know like and it, it impacts you in a heavy way and like when he's not like which I can like kind of like relate to like I don't know, it's just, you're like, I want that, I want to feel, like, the weight of that, um, mm -hmm. and I, and I do, yeah. and I think there's, like, but I want the, I want to feel the weight of it, but also in a healthy way, and almost, like, I'm thinking of, like, what you said about, you know, fear is the beginning of understanding, and, like, or wisdom, and, like, all that, and I'm just, like, trying to correlate all those things, and when I don't feel that way, you know, and, like, when I'm not, when it's not hitting me hard, like when I don't, when I'm not being convicted for what X, Y, Z, you know, mm -hmm. just really being honest with it, you know. I've been I've been really focusing on the practical recently, so more than just like, hey, can I think something or pray something? But what does it look like to practically do it? And that's just kind of there's a lot of things going on in our family right now, and it's like the just spiritual is not good enough. Like they like people are you know, dying and they need practical, like, what can I do today in my situation? So coming out of that vein, um, do you guys think or would you agree that the reason that the weight isn't there or whatever is because we forget about it? Like, we can read that now, but then we forget about it later? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I think we tend to compartmentalize, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, something I've been meditating on a lot since I heard it a few weeks ago, and Francis Chan was had a really awesome message. I don't remember exactly which one it was. 
but he was looking at Second Peter one and, and really kind of diving in deep to, and that's the thing. Every time we look at these verses, right? Like we can read something and kind of glance off the surface, or we can really say, okay, what do these words really mean? Like how do we, how do we really truly ingest these words? And and in two Peter one. Starting in verse four, like these, just really the way Francis Chan articulated them, just just grabbed a hold of my attention. I've been meditating on them for a while now, um, so I'm just going to read it real quick. A few verses here. Um, through through these, there have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these you might be partakers of the mighty like nature or the the godly nature, having escaped from the corruption in the world caused by lust. And for this reason, and so this ties this this ties back to this question, right? What do we do? How do we practically apply this? And I think we don't take it seriously enough. But here, here we go in verse five. For this reason, because we have because we have been given a, um, the nature of our Creator and the transformation through repentance and forgiveness, because of that, do your utmost, or as Francis Chan read it from his um, his version, um, you know, do everything possible. Um, exceedingly to add to your belief uprightness to uprightness knowledge to knowledge self-control to self-control endurance to endurance reverence to reverence brotherly affection and to brotherly affection love and so there's this progression that that ends up with love as, as the ultimate expression <clears throat> excuse me this ultimate expression of everything else that came before it um, and that just that blew me away when when you think about all the things that that we we want to do we know we should do right but really they all end in love and and it's not a pa it's not a passive walk we can't just intellectualize things and think okay you know yay we we believe we're saved etc cetera, etc cetera. There's, there's this radical do everything possible like to the point of of sweat and blood and tears to, to exercise this faith that we have. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. What I like about that is it's is it's putting it's it's sh it's letting us know that we are co uh, responsible for that end destination. Almost how much love we emit from our lives and receive. It, what it says make every effort. It doesn't just say receive, right? It says make mm -hmm. like make every effort. So like yeah, persecutions and trials are going to come and distractions and coverings and they. And he's saying, make every effort. And so <clears throat> I think it's really fitting. And I love that, um, how you just outlined it all ending in love. That's really powerful. Where, where I was getting at before with kind of the practical for me and, and this is, is I believe that that's a promise for us, that, that when we do those things, they will end in love. And I believe mm -hmm. that, um, that there's a promise for us when, in what I read in Hebrews. And I believe that God speaks individual promises to us and, uh, and when he does, I think that the enemy very much like the um, the seeds that are being sown in the, that parable, um, he wants to come pluck those seeds away before they can grab root. And uh, and I'm not saying that that verse is directly tied to what I'm saying here, but I think it's a really great analogy of that their seeds are planted, like a promise is planted in us, and and you you better guarantee the enemy is doing everything he can to steal those promises away so that we forget them. So going back when I ask you that question, why don't we live this out? And I said, do you guys agree that maybe it's because we forget them? And you guys both said yes. And so to me, one of the practical things I've really been working on with some encouragement um, from another ministry called Toth Ministries um, is the idea of keeping my promises in front of me. So as, as God gives me promises, doing, doing whatever it takes, so you know, would make every effort to keep that promise in front of me so that I don't forget it. And so for me, it's it's... It's writing on my body and putting things random places where it's going to like catch my attention that I wouldn't normally see, and just stuff like that. Because what I've found for myself is that if I don't keep those promises in front of me, I absolutely forget them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. And part of the, and this is exactly like the the passage that Nate had for us yesterday. Um, <laughs> To go back to that a little bit, Proverbs three talks about that promise. Even even as the chapter opens, so my son, do not forget my Torah or my instructions, 
and let your heart watch over my commands for length of days and long life and peace they add to you. So that's the promise. Like if you walk, basically Yahweh says, if you walk in my ways, my promise to you is that you'll have long life and peace. And then verse 3, let not kindness and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Again, put them in front of you. Like Hold on to those promises. <laughs> Thus finding favor and good insight in the eyes of Elohim and man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just powerful. And then if you skip down a few verses, you know, it says in, in verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. And, and the action of doing that in verse 8 is healing to your body and moistening to your bones. There's actually, you know, and, and this is so powerful that as we walk in in sync with our Creator's ways, it's actually life-giving health to our physical bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that brings up this other verse in Hebrews I was thinking about, which is ties into um, why we what you were just saying, like why we would want to seek His judgments and also um, a little bit of encouragement and kind of a little kick in the butt, like we shouldn't feel so bad about the things that are in front of us. So this is Hebrews 12, 1 through 8. Um, I might go on after that. I don't know. I'll start here. So it says, We too, then having uh, so great a cloud of witnesses all around us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to the prince and perfecter of our belief, Yahushua, for who the joy that was set before him endured the stake, having despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of Elohim. For consider him who endured such opposition from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your own lives. And this is where it's kind of, you know, we have those instructions in... Uh, or it was Hebrews 10 that I was reading before about why we don't want to trample. And it's like like we need to fight with, make every effort. And here Paul, we think it's Paul, is telling us, you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. So he's saying, he's saying that's, that's how far Yeshua took it for us. And he's saying, you're not, you know, most of us are very, a long, long ways away from, revis from resisting our own sin unto blood, right? Like, unto our lives or whatever, that's how much we're going to resist it. Except for you do have believers all around the world that are, they're giving up their lives for the king, which is just incredibly um, powerful and a huge witness. But So you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the appeal which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the discipline of Yahweh, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For whom Yahweh loves, he disciplines and flogs every son whom he receives. If you endure discipline, Elohim is treating you as a sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become sharers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Yeah, that's actually quoting Proverbs 3. The middle of, I was going to read that later on, Proverbs yeah. 3, 11, it actually goes full circle. Um, and I just, man, something else I was, I've been thinking about too, like later on in, in 2 Peter 1, just to really kind of hold, to, to hold on to and cling to the reality of this because this happened 2,000 years ago. We kind of think, oh, it, yeah, it's true, but we sort of, it's true, but, you know, I mean, a lot of people challenge the, the veracity of the Bible and is it a valid historical document? And there's all that debate, right? But um, this is so awesome. In 2 Peter 1, 18, he says, and we heard this voice, but actually I'll back up one, verse 17, 2 Peter 1, 17. For when he received respect and esteem from Elohim the Father, such a voice came to him from, from the excellent esteem, this is my son, the beloved in whom I did delight. And we, we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the set apart mountain. Um, and backing up a couple verses from that, um, after Peter says, you know, make every effort, right? He says in verse 15, I shall make every effort also to see that you always have a reminder of these things after my departure. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we made known to you the power and coming of our master, Yahushua Messiah, but we were eyewitnesses of his superbness. And then he goes on to, to describe the voice they heard from heaven on the, on the mount um, when Yahushua was, was transformed in front of them. So it's, it's something that we tend to forget. Like these are, 
when we know it, but it's the same thing as if I came to you and I said, guys, I had this experience. I saw this thing. I met, I met my creator physically, talked to him and saw him and, and had this relationship with him. And then we go on later and then we, we tell everybody we know, but then those people forget that, yeah, that was, that was a real thing that happened. And I think we often forget to stay anchored in the reality of, uh, of it just as real as we're talking to each other. That's how real the good news is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are, uh, what are you thinking, Shaw? We're getting close. Yeah, we're right on it, I think. Um, I'm not thinking anything. Well, I'm thinking lots of things, but nothing clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. This is kind of an interesting, an interesting one. Maybe it's just it's just a good, just sharing part of our story and uh, and uh, the hard love and just like beauty and seeking his judgments is kind of where I've been just. Um, trying to focus and just realizing how life-giving they are. but um, Well, in the question of who's the king of our life, mm-hmm. you know, can we speak with the same conviction that, that Peter was speaking there as he was writing, you know, and as he was sharing that letter with, with, with the readers that, that, he, that he was giving that to? Can we, can we tell others with the same conviction, we've encountered the king of the universe in our lives, and it's, we're not making this up. Like, this is no kidding for real, and this... And, and and how we live should flow out of that, right? So are the things that we do say and act upon, are those actions saying the king is for real king in our life? Or do we look like everyone else? Do we look like the world? Do we act like the world? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keeping our promise in front of us, believing the time is short, believing it's actually a mercy that we have this time to make the choice in those individual actions. Because what happens in our private our private worship, right? It's not what happens when we're outside our houses. It's it's the small choices we're making throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, I think that might be good. Good place. All right, you good, y'all? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's good. Thinking about a lot of things. Best day ever. Best day ever. Just Best saying. job I ever had. Best job I ever had. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Have a good week. <laughs>